Let me just welcome everybody to uh, our presentation tonight. Um, I did just a little bit of an update. Uh, we had a, a board meeting earlier today, and uh, and the main topic, of course, was Photographica that's coming up uh, in April. And uh, everyone seemed quite excited. I haven't seen so much exciting excitement on the board in a long time. Uh, part of that is, as you know, that uh, FISLI has been uh, involved with handling uh, Henry Weisenberger's uh, collection of cameras. And unfortunately, Henry passed away uh, a few years ago now. And uh, there's somewhere around uh, six, 700 cameras. And uh, the board, uh, we have a volunteer committee, uh, donation committee, been very busy in cataloging all those cameras. And many of them uh, will be put up for sale at the Photographica auction. Um, there's a wide range, uh, some, some fairly inexpensive ones and some very expensive ones. So we're all sorting that out. But um, if you want to see some of Henry's collection, by all means, and, and actually maybe own a piece or two, uh, uh, make sure you show up at Photographica. And that's uh, April 22nd, I think, uh, 20th, 20th. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it back to Dana. We have a, speaking of cameras, we, we have a great presentation tonight with, with Ken Hardaway from Illinois. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Dana, and you can introduce our speaker. Thank you. The speaker tonight is Ken Huff. Ken is a former employee and a longtime collector and expert on Deardorff cameras. Uh, his article in Snapshots is a blast from the past. And um, I'm going to uh, let him take it away. Thank you for joining us, Ken. Oh, you're welcome. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Let me get to my screen here and I have nothing there. How about that? Still nothing. Oh, what the heck? How we got it? You got a picture now? No. Can you see the picture that you had up? You have to select that when you share. I did. Yeah. I did. And it's not showing. Let's do this. Hold on. Have Perfect. Yep. That's it. Okay, here we go. Oh, boy. Well, where to start is always difficult with the LF Deardorff company. Um, they... L.F. Deardorff, Laban F. Deardorff is his name. He was born in Ohio as a Church of the Brethren. They were self-sufficient people. They basically made everything. If it was broken, they would fix it. They didn't require to go out and buy something. They'd make it. Um, he took a business course and wanted to go into business, but he also liked photography. So he worked at various um, uh, photographic emporiums um, in Chicago. And while he was in Chicago, he came across a guy by the name of Carlton, who worked for Rochester Optical. And he supplied him with a design for a camera and built the camera. And they came along, Rochester Optical came along, or Rochester Camera Company, came along and put some of their some of his ideas into production one of them which i've only recently discovered was the king camera by rochester camera company and the king camera which is you're, you're looking at now has some very distinct well design um uh well similar to a deer door and if Merle's, or excuse me, if Laban saw this camera and if it was made before him, he blatantly stole some ideas from the camera and put it in production on his camera. But there's a lot of interesting similarities to the camera. The camera was made in 5x7, 810, and 11x14. And then we come across the 1923 design <coughs> camera um, that Deardorff started building. A very typical English folding field camera. 
And again, it's similar to that King camera. A lot of uh, similarities from the, if you can see my cursor, this is the stop um, lock for the rising panel on the front, which the, the lens slides in a panel like the King does. You've got excess movements on the front for shooting tall buildings, all sorts of interesting features that was good for architectural photography. They made 10 of these over a period of about seven years from 1923 to 1930. The interview I have had with Merle Deerdorf in the 80s, um, he had some uh, ideas about how to make the camera a little bit better. Now, for instance, this position this camera is in now, right now, you've got front swings on this camera, even though they don't physically show up in a mechanism on the front standard. You put the lens over the tripod hole and you rotate the camera so you can shine flung horizontally. And of course you have front tilt with this and you can tilt the camera, uh, tip, tip the lens forward. The reason this camera is stuck in this position um, is that the bellows are so bloody stiff, they don't want to flex anymore. And they're the original bellows on it. And one of these days, I'm going to change it out and put something a little softer on uh, as soon as I can find some good leather. Uh, I'll have a set made. The camera is self-casting, as you can see here. It came with four little rubber bumpers on it. Those are not original, but they are identical to what the camera had. And it had what's called a parquet bed, which is a bunch of different size wood panels. They are stapled together and glued. This middle panel on some of them actually floated. It was not glued in. This one's glued. So they were experimenting and changing their design all throughout the, these first 10 cameras. This one is either number six or number nine. They wrote on the underside here, underneath the, the top uh, piece of wood on the rear frame, they wrote in pencil, what number it was. And I have no idea which it is supposed to be, six or nine. There's the back. It also has Rochester Optical Company rear springs because he was friends with the company and they supplied him with back springs. Pardon the dust on the cameras, we all suffer that. The top corners, these were all hand cut. They were cut with a, a chisel. In fact, I have the chisel. Um, they would drill a hole on the, on the uh, uh, piece of phosphor bronze and they would chisel this slot in and shape it that way. So these were all handmade. The, these pieces here are very simple. This is a piece of square tubing, square brass tubing that has been slotted and you get two pieces out of one. So things were not um, custom made. They were just simply pretty much off the shelf items and modified. The rear turntable here, this is uh, a piece of Aluminum that was bent in a break, shaped and bent. This camera um, is at the George Eastman house. And when I gave a talk on Deerdorf at Photo History many years ago, um, I asked Todd Gustafson, he was just fairly new there then, 
if he had a Deerdorf. And he goes, yeah, I've got one. And I said, do you know what year it's from? He had no idea. And I said, well, let's take the bellows out and see. And we unscrewed the bellows on the back and pulled it out. And there was a number two written on it. And I just about flipped because how did George Eastman come up with number the second camera made? But something here shows me what they did. This is the inventory card and they bought that camera in 1926. So the first camera was evidently made in 1923 or 1924. The second one didn't come along for another couple of years. And then the rest of them filled in until 1930. Here's an example on my camera of a date from Boston Gear Company, 11-28 was when that gear was made. So that gives you a pretty good idea of exactly when the camera was built within a few months of that, I'm sure. Here's their first catalog. I wonder if that was number one or number two that they used for the photograph. It shows the different positions the camera could be put in. Um, this is, you know, a look down tele, a look down long lens, not telephoto. A look down with a long lens, a wide angle view with extreme rise, which other cameras simply did not have, and of course, self-casing. Uh, this one is number 17 um, that I got. And it's also one of the very early ones. It has the aluminum and wood front standard which marks it as being one of the first ones made. They had nice brass nameplates put on. Now, the interesting thing is here is that you have three brothers working at the factory. Uh, you have Russell, Mil John Milton, and, um, oh, gosh. <laughs> lose it Merle of course Merle and Merle didn't believe that the camera needed a nameplate or anything so some of the cameras he assembled have no identifying features on it at all no name no nothing uh, because he believed that the camera could stand on its own as far as um, identity I don't know if any of you have heard about the bar tops that were used to make the early cameras. When they started building cameras, they came up and they were short of mahogany. And because of prohibition, there were a lot of bar tops that had been scrapped, a lot of bars had closed, and they gathered up a few bar tops and cut them up and put them into pieces of wood that could be built into cameras. This is a plugged hole in one of them. They matched the grain up a little bit and filled the hole in, uh, used glue, and the gap was filled in with talcum powder. In fact, that's why all of these lines here are um, white, because it was a talcum powder that was used as a wood filler. Close up of showing the staples holding things together. This was a sand cast rear swing mechanism. They machined their own knobs. They had a Pratt and Whitney lathe that was built in the 1850s that was there when I was there and I used it. Um, and we made parts on it. They didn't have anything small. This lathe was, was a 18-inch uh, swing lathe. This particular camera is number 17A, which came from the third production run.
pretty much a standard back on this camera. Uh, the back of this camera looks almost identical to a camera made in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and on till the end. Okay, here, oh, I'm sorry, not 17A, it was number 2A, sorry. I've got 17A also. Um, they stamped the camera, they stamped the wood parts with a number and a letter signifying the run. Now, if you ever get into Deerdorf parts and the nomenclature for parts, you have parts that were numbered or labeled V8ABBA-1. And it was, that would be like the handle. They just didn't call it handle. It had this long nomenclature to it. And you can see that it was cut with a circular saw. Um, this camera is number 12, I believe. Anyway, um, it has an aluminum front standard, and that's because it was broken in use. And the person who broke it was Margaret Burkwhite. She had used that camera for a job in Chicago before she went overseas. And evidently she was fending off a pig at the stockyards. And this is a, the wood and aluminum front standard, which is very brittle and very prone to breaking. This is the back of her camera. This is the next version camera that came out that pretty much made the camera out of standardized metal parts. This is an eight by 10. It has a red, reddish wood finish, uh, which is made out of aniline dye, uh, alcohol-based uh, stain. And it has gold painted metal parts. And the reason they painted them gold was that the early cameras, this was a satinized finished using pumice and a piece of felt. And you, you, you rub the pumice on the brass and it would streak it. And then you would overlay it with uh, shellac and preserve it from tarnishing. This, you just sprayed the paint on much less work. Red bellows, nothing fancy. Everybody thinks a camera of Deardorff with red bellows is rare. Well, it may be rare, it makes it, doesn't make any value at all. It doesn't change the value at all because they had a, a problem with getting black leather. It was being used in the automotive industry. And because they were in Chicago, there was a lot of leather tanning companies in Chicago, up by the lake, uh, by the stockyards, they were everywhere. They couldn't get black leather, so they used red. The problem with red was that the red, the red, the chemicals used in tanning red leather tended to rot the leather over a period of years. They were nice when they were new. They probably lasted 10 or so years without any issue, but after that, they tended to dry out and have problems. And you can see somebody has repaired this with red tape. The back view of an eight by 10, this little spot here um, is a piece of microscope glass. So you can get an aerial image and focus on the aerial image and get an extremely sharp focus on what you're shooting. Here is a corner. It's stamped on a on a press, and it became the standard corner that didn't change from a roughly the 1930s all the way till the end of production. There it is compared to a handmade one. 
here's the bottom of a bed that obviously had some issues and it had had a plug put in the middle. They went to a four piece bed, which works out okay for the most part, if they really season the wood well, meaning in the drying room for a year or two or even three. Um, because if the humidity is too high at these far ends of the uh, bed, they tend to shrink and they get a gap here and they split. And I can't tell you how hard it is to grow that wood out, get the moisture right in it, get it swollen up again and gluing it back together and hoping it stays. Some accessories that they had, a level. And that was about it. This is a camera I used for a long, long time. Uh, I got it, it had no front swings. I put front swings on it. I put this old Tessar lens on it and it just, God, I took a lot of pictures with this thing. So you could, you could take that 1930s model and very easily convert it to a very modern camera with front swings. And I too put microscope cover glass slides in there and I used some black hair um, for my eye to focus on. The lines here are not black, they are clear lacquer that was silk screened on to the ground glass. The problem with it was that over a period of time, the lacquer would flake off the glass and you couldn't do anything about it except wash the glass in acetone, get the lacquer off of it and draw some lines on it with a, a ruling pen. Here's a catalog. I have a feeling that this camera on the cover is my camera. I'll explain that in a minute. Um, this, is a, this is my camera, it's a baby Deerdorf. And I'm, uh, these cameras, by the way, are in chronological order. Okay, so just so you know, they, they're done in order that they were built. A guy by the name of Korth took Ch a Chicago a souvenir book took pictures from buildings with this camera and the plasma and he did um did a nice job he really did i bought this camera from him uh at a chicago camera show he was a very very old guy and he walked into the the uh the chicago camera show and he walked found my booth that i was at and he came over he goes you like deardorfs don't you and i said yeah i do and he goes, I got something for you. And he showed it to me. And I said, what do you want for? He goes, I don't want it anymore. You can have it. He gave it to me. That was a shocker. It really was. This was only four by five. It started out as a project for the Chicago World's Fair. The World's Fair came into the city and they had a rule that a camera could not be any could not be four by five. It had to be smaller than four by five. So the original baby Deardorff was designed to be a three and a quarter, four and a quarter camera. It never got finished. And the guy who wanted it, a lawyer in Chicago who was trying to get away with taking better pictures, um, never got the camera. So right after the, after the fair was over, Merle got some requests for a four by five. And he said, okay, I'll put it in service or put it in production. And they did. And they made 10 of these very early ones that have just certain design features that the other ones don't have, like a wood separator strip that the 8x10 and the 5x7 had. Um, the problem with that was this front extension, if you racked it out, uh, it fell off the camera. And pretty soon they were having some problems and oh, they they well, they're having some problems. And they they came up with the solution was having an extrusion made. They did a black baby Deardorf, and this is it. Um, they would custom make cameras for people. 
people think every Deardorff is a brown camera or a red camera, but they would they would bow down to the request of a photographer. He wanted a black one, they would lacquer it for them. This one was sold not as a four by five, but as a two and a quarter, three and a quarter. And this is the extrusion that guides the front extension and the back extension um, and doesn't fall out. It's very nicely made, very precision. This one is the last baby Deardorff made, and I built it. Um, Jack gave me a box of parts. Um, he said, we haven't fixed any babies in years. You can have these parts, take them. And I said, thanks. And I went through them, and I found out I had enough parts to build a camera, and I did. So this is the last baby Deardorff made. I think I did it in 88. Oh yes, color photography at its best with a baby Deardorff, of course. Another catalog page. Five by seven cameras were built along the same line as the uh, eight by tens starting in the 1930s. This is a red finish camera, four and a half by four and a half lens board. Um, and the reason they did that was it could accept a bigger flange and a longer lens and a larger, wider lens than a four by four board that the Eastman cameras had. But then people didn't like buying the four and a half by four and a half board. And they went back to, or they went to a four by four board um, that they could get anywhere. As you can see, it looks just like an eight by 10, except for size. My personal favorite is a four by five special. Um, same size as the five by seven camera. In fact, it is a five by seven camera. And the reason they call it a special is that it had a special order back to it. Um, in 1950 or 51, they added front swings um, for architectural photography and product photography, making it a little bit easier to use. They had a variety of backs. This one I call the Cadillac or the Rolls Royce because it has a, um, a rotating graph lock back. And I use roll film holders a lot. So this is really, really nice to use. These were, were a little bit longer in size, lengthwise for, for, for longer lenses than the Kodak cameras were at the time or anybody else's. Uh, I believe we were talking about 24 inches. And it has the, well, the extreme look down that you always use for advertising. Look at what my look at our camera can do. We can turn it into a pretzel, and you'll still get a sharp image. This camera, uh, I have one also that has this bellows on it. This was a bellows that Jack Deardorff designed towards the end of the Chicago business. Uh, it will accommodate a fifty millimeter lens. It will fold up, as you can see the pleats here. There are 13 different size pleats in this camera. It doesn't sag. It has very narrow ones in the front and they progressively get wider and wider and wider and only by a 16th of an inch in some instances. Um, it's a great bellows. And it hasn't pinholed yet. And it's almost 25, 30 years old. Ah, this is a US Navy outfit. This 
camera case, holds a four by five with a graph lock back on it. Uh, I don't have it outfitted in this picture like it was in the Navy. In the Navy, you would have cut film holders and graphmatics in these uh, boxes here. And, but I do have all the wide field ectars um, that came in the original box. The case itself is three quarter inch thick plywood. Let's put it this way, folks. You can't lift this thing up. It's got two handles on it. I don't know which way to hold it because it's just so uncomfortably hard to move it around. I used to put it in my car and leave it there um because it was so heavy to move around but i shoot with a 58 millimeter uh grand gun and then i've got my uh my um um centigore here by gertz which is a really nice lens wide angle uh dagor i got a dagor i think the dagor sold it up in the camera um but it's a really easy and lovely camera to use here I am at a tractor show um, photographing a tug of war between a tractor and some people. And I'm using a wide angle, it's in the wide angle position and a roll film back. Now we come to the Triama Pro. Triama Pro stands for Triple Extension Amateur Professional. And this camera here belonged to Merle and it's brand new. Uh, it doesn't look it. It's got, I got to re, really dye it again and put some polish on it. But I've never put film in it, neither had he. There's the, there's two extensions and then the third one one, two, three. Then there's a really neat trick here. It does. Front tilt, geared rise and fall, and front, front lateral slide and lateral swing. It has a revolving back. It does wide angle with a triple, ex, triple extension wide angle bed built into the box. The box is one extension. There's the second one, and here's the third one. And a revolving back. Multiple tilt uh, bed for bed tilt on it. This one's got a Hugo Meyer range or finder on it, which is calibrated for 162 millimeter lens, Kodak lens. Here's one that I built, um, not the camera, I built the revolving back. Uh, Jack gave me all the Trimer Pro parts too. And uh, I took one of the graph lock backs that they had from um, Graflox Sub C, which was the when the Japanese owned Graflox, and I modified it, machined it down so it fit on the back turntable. And I showed it to Merle before he retired, and he said, "Boy, I wish I had you 20 years ago." And I said, "I was 12 then," and um, well, it didn't work out, obviously. There were two five by seven Triumph Pros made, and there are two versions of this camera, uh, the four by five. One has a problem of vignetting when you put it at, the, at an angle here. Uh, and they made it a quarter of an inch bigger and you don't get vignetting anymore. They bought Graflux finders from the company they had, I think this is the slickest Art Deco level I've ever seen. Um, it's made out of brass and nickel plated, and it's just a beauty. As the camera, as they ran out of parts 
in the 40s, they, the, the geared front rise and fall fell away to using a uh, piece of aluminum front standard with a couple slots in it and locking knobs. So that's, that's one of the last ones built. And it has a uh, Kalart binder on it. The ugly camera of the company. This is a home portrait camera. The front lens panel, it came with a Dogmar lens by Gertz. So it had a sliding panel that went to the left and to the right. And you could get two pictures. There's one view. There's another view. And you could get two pictures on five by seven with, with this camera. And it was used for as, it's a horrible phrase, but it's the only one these guys ever used. They called them kidnapping cameras, where they would take it into the house and take pictures of babies in a crib or in a bassinet. Um, because it had some rear movement to it. Oh, I'm sorry. This is how you said the dividing board back and forth. There was a lever, this lever right here. And you could go from left to right. You just had to remember what side of the film you were shooting. And it had a hole drilled in the middle for critical focus. People wonder why the corners are cut on a back. It's not to let air out. Everybody thinks it's for venting. There's plenty of spots around the wood frame on a view camera for air to come out of the camera when you're moving it back and forth and focusing. These holes here, these corners are to look through. If you look through those holes and you see light coming through the lens, it means you have coverage to the corner of the glass and your format. And the really ugly duckling camera, this is the home portrait done in Blondet. Um, for those of you old enough to remember the Blondet finishes that came out with furniture in the 50s, this is one of them. This was a brand new camera sitting on the shelf at the shop. And I saw it up there one day, we were moving stuff around. And I said, Jack, you got a home portrait up here. And he goes, you want it? The guy never paid for it. And I said, sure. So he gave it to me. And it had, it had a sliding carriage back on it that was custom made to fit that camera specifically. Normally, a sliding carriage back could also be turned vertically. This was set to only be horizontal. When you slide this side to side, when it latches, it makes such a noise. I think it would just scare the heck out of any little kid that you're taking a picture of. So you could, you could, you had a diaphragm. This thing here is called the diaphragm and it blocks half the image off. You can remove that diaphragm and take a full frame. Some people buy these cameras to shoot stereo pictures with stereo pairs and they do pretty well with it. Some of the accessories Deardorff had was a lens board adapter that would go six by six to four by four or four and a half by four and a half or three and a half by three and a half of the baby. And they would put a Packard shutter on the back end of it. So you could synchronize um, barrel lenses. I had decals made on all the refinished cameras I did. I put a white decal on. So it would be differentiated from the gold or silver ones. Now we got 1950 something and we've got the standard eight by 10 that was made and was made right up until the finish of the production of the camera in Chicago. This one is number 500. It was on eBay one night and I looked at it and I thought, well, that's kind of neat. 
It turns out it was the first one sold with front swings in 1951. And I contacted the guy who was selling it and it had sold to a guy in Phoenix. And he gave me his name and I called the guy up in Phoenix and I said, I'll trade you a camera for your camera. I'll trade you a new camera. And he says, well, I don't even have this thing yet. And he got it a week later and it had some issues, very stiff bellows. And he said, I'll take you up on it. And I said, great. He goes, do you teach photography? And I said, yeah, I can teach you how to use it. So he hired me. I, I flew out to, well, I took the train out to um, Phoenix and spent a couple of days with him and taught him how to use a camera. I gave him a brand new camera and I got this one in, in exchange. So I'm really happy to have the first one. It makes my collection pretty, pretty, um, pretty solid. Um, after 1951, when they got an order for almost 400 cameras from the Air Force, the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines, they wanted a solid camera. They wanted a solid base on the camera, and they required a bed plate. So the bed plate came out in the 50s. It would be put on hundreds and hundreds of cameras afterwards. Uh, because people thought that it was nice and it didn't scratch up the wood anymore. My favorite lens, uh, 4.5, 12 inch um, Ektar. Just a great, just a great lens. Back view, standard, standard camera, standard 8x10, has four dividing boards in it. So you can take those out and get 8x10, or you can get um, 5x8 or um, yeah, five by eight this way, or um, four by 10 the other way by, by removing one or all of them. This is one thing that people for some reason lose. And I'm so glad I had a bunch made because for years I would, I was, I could sell them up here. Although I did have to teach them how to sand, make a sanding block because they were custom fit to all the cameras. Working end of the camera, nickel plated hardware. Um, I actually refinished this camera. The wood is still nice, but the nickel plating, I really have to go over with a, uh, a purple scotch bright pad and polish it up a little bit. That won't scratch the finish. There you can see number 500. They made a 8x20, well, actually, it's a 12 by 20 with an 8x20 accessory back, and that's what that one is. Um, it's just plain heavy. There's no other way to describe that camera other than it weighs a ton. Um, it's about 35 pounds. It's not easy for me to lift it up on the tripod anymore at all. But you can see that it collapses very wide. This is not a wide angle lens, by the way. I just did this to show uh, in, in, in the minimum compression that you can have. Lewis Kelsey was an in-law to the company. He married one of the daughters of Laban. And Kelsey was very instrumental in getting things built at the company. And he came out with a book called Corrective Photography in 1947. They made 500 copies of it. And in it, they had photographs of interiors, exteriors, and they showed how the camera was set up to take the picture. What I have always found interesting on these shots here is that they're showing front movements like a slight little bit of horizontal swing on the front. And the camera they were making in 1947 did not have horizontal swing yet. It didn't come out until 1950. So it was always a bit of a surprise. 
Now, if you're sensitive to different types of pictures of people, I'm going to warn you now ahead of time, there's a couple of pictures in here that are a little risque. Um, this is another camera they built, uh, 8 by 10 to 11 by 14 in size on a bipost stand, and they made hundreds of these things. And they all became pretty obsolete at one point and got sold off. There was a studio in Chicago, Cranston uh, Studio, Vogue Wright, a um, couple other studios. They had 50 and 60 of these cameras in their studios, taking pictures of furniture, taking pictures of the home interiors that the companies would build and set up in these gigantic um, galleries. Um, gosh, this is a what's called a Deardorff monopost, and it's not counterweighted. So this thing, if you loosen this up, you better have your hand on it because it'll it'll drop on you. But it's a nice stand. It's called a handy stand. Up oh, there's the risque picture. I warned you. There's more risque, yes siree. Foundation wear. Then they had stamps. They got on the, uh, the US Postal Service issued a stamp on photography and there's a Deardorff in the picture. And that thing came up for sale on eBay about five or six years ago and I missed getting it. I really wanted to have it. These are printing plates I have from the company um, for their catalogs. And there I am with some of my collection. Another shot of me, I used to take tractor portraits of people with their tractors, um, steam, gas, or whatever. The problem is once you shoot everybody, nobody wanted another picture of themselves. And that, folks, is it. And thank you. Um, that was spectacular and really entertaining. Uh, everyone can unmute and give Ken a round of applause. Yes. There are a couple of questions in the chat. And uh, we'll do those and then maybe go to some live questions. I'm going to post, Ken, this is the link that was in snapshots. I'm just gonna check that it goes to your site. I mistake a bit of a time to load, but um, there it is. Okay. So um, Mark, I believe mentioned that We'd love to reach out to you, re his four by five baby Deerdorf, and he's in Oregon. So if you want to include your email address in the chat, um, maybe Mark can connect with you. Well, can I give it to you now? Sure. Okay, guys, if you want my email, here it is. It's the letter K, the number four, S as in Sam, B as in Baker, at frontier.com. Great. Thank you. And um, you're welcome. There's a question from Becky who asks Could you say more about color photography with these cameras? When did they start producing them for color photography? Well, color photography in the Z camera doesn't make any difference because the lens will shoot color no matter what lens you put on it. Um, but color photography really came into vogue uh, in the 40s. Um, the Deardorff company, I don't really think they, they, they concentrated on anything like that specifically, but the lens, the lens companies did. So lens companies like Kodak, they started coating their lenses with magnesium fluoride. So you had less reflection and a little bit better 
color transmission uh, through the lens. It wasn't a camera function, it was a lens function. So as the cameras evolved, the lenses evolved with them, I guess. A lot of companies um, um, had uncoated lenses and Deerdorf actually had a service that they would coat a lens for you. Uh, they didn't do it themselves. They sent it off to a shop in Chicago that had was an optical shop that did it um, for about 10 or 15 years. Great. Um, let's see. Hope says, I worked as a photographer with the NYPD in the 1980s and was told the crime scene photos up until the 60s were taken with 8 by 10 Eerdorfs. Um, you know, this is true. There were several police departments that used 8 by 10s in crime scene photography. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know what New York was like, but I know San Francisco sure had them um, because they had a surplus sale about 20 years ago and there were like 10 of them that ended up being sold that were used in, in scene, or, you know, in criminal investigations, yeah. Uh, here's a message from Rob Niederman, and that's <laughs> hi, hi Ken, having originally lived in the Chicago area over the years, I've heard a lot of stories about the company. I understand there was a rather interesting bookkeeper at the factory, what can you tell us about that? Oh boy. Well, when I started going up to the shop, um, there was this little gray haired lady who was Polish and she always had, she was always put together really nice. And, and she would be sitting at her Burroughs Adams, the one with the hand crank lever. And she would be doing books and I would say, hi, Wanda, you know, and, and she would just kind of wave at me and I'd walk by. Um, didn't think anything of her at all. Um, she was one of those people that she didn't speak English in the shop, and I had no idea if she even knew what I was saying. I mean, I figure she did. Um, anyway, after the company went out of business, I got a call from a guy by the name of Jamie Graff, G-R-A-F-F, out of Chicago. He was the Time Magazine Bureau Chief for Chicago. And he asked me if I knew a Wanda Kaczynski uh, who was instrumental in saving a view camera company. And I, on the phone, I just kind of like, no, I don't know any Wanda Kaczynski. And then I looked, I went downstairs where my files are and I looked in the, 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 the employee uh, binder, file, file binder, and I thumb through it, through it and I saw Wanda Kaczynski and I called him back. I said, yeah, I do know who she was, but I never talked to her because she never spoke English to me. Well, a couple nights later, I see Wanda Kaczynski on the news and it turns out she was the Unabomber's mother. So that gives you an interesting fact on what type of people got hit got hired, you know, um, she was fine, but she spoke perfect English too when she was being interviewed by Channel 2 in Chicago. So yes, the so Unabomber's mother worked for L.F. Deerdorf. Wow. Um, and boy, you did get quiet just now. <laughs> uh, so there's one... Uh anecdote from Mark in Oregon about an eight by 10 Deerdorf. Uh, not sure if Jake from Blue Moon is here. He says he purchased an eight by 10 from Ackroyd Photography. Um, four by five, yes, never used it. Jake asked how many sheets, like five a year. He noted not man enough for the eight by 10, bought it, shot his outstanding book contact with it great images. I understand that you service it. Yay. Oh, did I work on it? I guess. Okay. I, who, who's, who, whose camera is it? Whose camera is it? What name is it? Um, 
Mark, do you want to unmute? Oh, Jake Shivery, Shivery, S H I V E R Y. I don't know. I don't remember the name, but I've worked on so many cameras. I remember cameras by the way they were damaged. Mark <laughs> says, necessarily... Blue Moon. Bar Mark says, Blue Moon camera in Portland. I can't, I don't remember. I'm sorry. Um, the Chicago World's Fair story is very interesting. I love that. Um, just the... yeah. there was a lot of it was all politics. They just didn't want somebody going in there and photographing and getting better pictures than what the company photographers were getting. Um, and unfortunately, the cameras just never got built. They were just too busy building cameras for their for their business than taking a custom job on. Uh, but they eventually uh, uh, did come out with that camera. The same thing with the Triama Pro. Um, one of the guys uh, who was out in the field, not servicing, they were servicing stores, um, went to a store and they said, do you have any cameras like a, like a speed graphic? And the guy said, well, yes, we do. And it didn't exist. And he came back to the shop in Chicago a couple of weeks later and said to Merle, he, Merle goes, well, how do the orders go? Well, I picked up some orders. And I picked up some orders for a couple of orders for a press camera. And he goes, we don't make a press camera. And he goes, well, can you do it? He goes, okay, fine. And Merle spent six months, drew up the, the Triumph Pro and went into production. They did not make a lot of Triumph Pros, but they did stuff that Linhoff didn't do until another 10 years later. So it was interesting that they would say, sure, we'll do it. And it didn't, it wasn't part of their product line. Do you have any of the drawings? I saw you have some of the print plates. <clears throat> Excuse me. I do have some, some blueprints. Um, they are way out of date. Um, if I need, need parts, I just, I have a camera somewhere that's identical to what I need to make parts from. So I just measure that part. Yeah. Yeah. Do you work with anyone who machines parts or are you doing all this yourself? Oh, I do it all myself. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a machine shop. I don't do it anymore because my hands are crippled from, from RA. So it's really tough for me to grab a, grab a, even, even on my milling machine to make anything. It's just, it hurts. So I, I mean, I retired five years ago. Um, Sid is asking, what were the best sellers in the product line? <clears throat> depended on, it depended on if there was an article in some magazine. When, um, when View Camera Magazine came out, I wrote a story on 8x10 Deardorfs. And Jack got an influx of orders for eight by 10 Deardorfs a couple of months later. So it was, it was really, it was really kind of um, hit and miss whether or not what the popular ones were. Um, eight, four by five specials always sold good. The five by seven camera with the four by five back always, always sold good. There was a lot of requests for the four by five baby Deardorf, a new new version of that. And we had drawn that up um, prior to Jack dying. Um, and it would have gone into production of some sort, I'm sure. Um, something with a revolving back and a four by four board, or at least a Linhoff board. I pushed for a Linhoff board big time because Linhoff boards are available worldwide. And that, that would have made it a much easier camera to um, to go out if you bought a lens somewhere in a different country you go to that camera shop they always have Linoff boards so it's more we're trying to make it more international uh, we'll do a few more questions we're a little bit over but um, Barry is saying that he has a 
five by seven with a four by five non-rotating graph lock back, which looks like it came from a graphic view. Is the back an actual Deerdorf part or someone's hack? Oh, no, 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 no. The graphic view, uh, the silver back was bought by Deerdorf to put on a revolving back. So that's completely legit. They they didn't make they did not make the metal part for a uh, revolving back. They just bought it from Graflock or Graflex. So that's completely legit. And one more question from Kirill uh, says: I hope you will talk about what made the Deerdorf so special. Oh. <laughs> um, easy. Um, Richard Avedon was a friend of mine, and we talked every few months about stuff until he died. Um, and he just loved that camera. He felt that that camera had a, a, a sense of what it was doing, which just sounds really weird, but he said the camera was so easy to use, and without any pretense, he could get great pictures. And I find that too. When I was shooting with mine a lot, it had there was nothing. It was nothing to do but just take pictures. You didn't have to worry about knobs or locking or anything like that. It just was easy and nice to use. And it's a pretty looking camera. It really comes across in the photos you took and the stories you told. I mean, it it's just a great great talk that you've given us tonight it's been really wonderful well, thanks and uh i hope that you know as a fisney member you've got a free year of membership that you'll join us again for more of these presentations oh um, i've got all sorts of stuff to talk about <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much Definitely. um i'm going to uh leave the meeting open for a couple of minutes so folks can chat and uh I know that Chuck, I'm sorry I inter in interrupted you when you were talking about the SX70, but if you want to post that link for that company, um, if you have the info, um, that'd be great. Yeah, I can do that. Also, I want to compliment uh, Ken on his presentation. And I just happened to pick up my Bible, the uh, McEwen's camera uh, book. And uh, Ken, you are mentioned several times in the Deerdorf section. Is well, being wrote, so there's a that, there's a verification there. I wrote that section. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course. <laughs> well, <laughs> good for you. <laughs> That's very good. Um, just want to remind folks, we don't have a, a Zoom speaker meeting in April due to Photographica. Um, so we won't be presenting at the beginning of April. I'm working on the beginning of May right now. So um, to be announced. And um, I hope that folks will communicate with Ken about their dear dwarfs and have some good back and forth conversations. Um, anyone else have one last question before we uh, I have a comment, uh, Dana. We, we received as a donation last summer an eight by a beautiful eight by ten Deerdorf, which we sold on eBay recently, and also the collection of Henry Weisenberger that's going to be the feature of uh, the photographic show. We actually have a four by five Deerdorf in that collection too, which and will either be on eBay or at the show. The show on the twentieth um, opens at nine, goes till four, then there's a four o'clock preview of the auction. And then the auction starts at 4.30 if I'm reading the flyer right. So mark your calendars. Um, we hope to see as many of you who can come at Photographica. And can thanks, Chuck, Paul. Can, can Chuck give us the information on retrospect, please? On, on what? Sorry, Bill. Uh, on on the, the company with the SX-70, the retrospect. Oh, I just put it on. Should be in the chat. So I don't see it. Uh, neither do I. I don't see it either. Yeah. It, well, anyway, it this is this is what it is. It's uh, it's uh, let's see if I can do this. It's retrospect 
I'll type with, it in. With, with, with a K, dot com. And they uh, sell uh, Polaroid uh, repair services. You can buy a new Polaroid uh, SX, uh, uh, X, uh, X, XS uh, 680, which was the last uh, radar focused one for 900 bucks if you want one of those. Um, or you can uh, get any one of the uh, more plasticky 600 cameras for as little as $150. And they also mm -hmm. sell a film. They also sell Sony Walkmans. They sell uh, old black and white TVs. Uh, anything that uh, will take you back to 1970 is what they what they offer. And they also purchase the cameras. And they also purchase cameras. Yes, mules. Thank you. There's usually an SX70 floating around at Photographica, at least one. So. No, oh, I've uh, got a couple. <laughs> Um, and Ken, you're in Indiana, is that right? I am in Indiana, yes. So, um, you well, know, I admit it. <laughs> the tractor photos, I want to see more tractor photos. Oh, God. I've got dozens of them. <laughs> I shot them on everything from 8 by 10 to 14 by 17. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, and it was it was interesting because there was the typical especially with the eight by ten there's it was, you know where'd you get that old camera well it's not old i built it and there they people just have no clue about things and now the, and the amish were even much more fun because i actually got to photograph some amish they wanted me to take pictures of them because it was a wood camera and they appreciated the wood the use of wood in a camera um so it was really neat it was a lot of fun did they make many panoramic cameras uh the 8 by 20 and the 12 by 20 i would say there are probably about a couple hundred of them wow that was it because the 12 by 20 was used for the kodak colorama wow. um photography and, and and supposedly, and I've never been able to verify this, supposedly they make 35 cameras for the Colorama program, but they didn't get used. Um, Ansel Adams had one for about a month and he couldn't stand using it because it was too heavy when he tried to get it up on his car. <laughs> you know, and he sent a scathing letter to Merle about the weight of it. I've got that letter somewhere in my in my in my bunt in my stuff. I'm not sure where it is, but it's like he said, why didn't you make this much lighter? It's so easy to shoot with, it's so hard to shoot with. And my ANSCO or whatever he was shooting with is so easy to use. Um and then they started they built Deirdre built a couple of handheld um cameras for the Colorama program that had handles on its side. That's really neat. I should have posted those pictures. I just don't know where they're at right now. Well, um, maybe we need to do a follow-up at some point. <laughs> Whatever, sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you so much. It's been wonderful. I'm gonna close out the meeting. Um, thanks everyone for joining us and had a terrific job. Thanks for doing uh, this, Dana. Uh, it's it's really been wonderful. Um, Thank you. Very good. Thanks, everyone. Oh, and um, Mark is at bluemooncamera.com, and he says he has Deerdorfs. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. <laughs> they last forever. <laughs> All right. Good night, folks. Okay. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Thank good you. Night.